What do you have to do now to go for Olympic gold? Uh, well, between professional and Olympic, I'm, I'm much heavier than the other Olympic girls, so I've got to drop about six kilos in six weeks to get back down to... to uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it, go for January. Um, so, I'm, obviously, you know, I'm running every day and all that sort of stuff, but like I said before, we, we train about eight hours a day, but because I'm working and I'm actually I'm holding down three jobs at the moment um, so that I can afford to train, and um, it, I'm not doing the hours that I need to, to, to do it, but I'm, I'm focusing on making myself more time and, and getting as many hours on the water as possible. And I've got my first blister again, so I'm getting my calluses up. And so it's, it's going to take a lot of hard work. And, it, and to be honest, it's going to cost about $100,000 to do my Olympic trials over the next year because I have to go to numerous events in Europe. Um, and they go from December this year until December next year um, over those events. So... Yeah, if anyone wants to sponsor me. <laughs> Lucille's um, sitting next to you nodding. Um, she knows from women's basketball uh, how tough... I don't think she ever stayed with a leg together. But, uh, Lucille, uh, t talk to us about the, the basketball. Well, basketball Australia and uh, Carrie Graff, who's here, uh, are looking to bring our overseas players back before the Olympics to ensure proper preparation. Um, you have, of course played at the highest level and you know what goes into a, a basketball career and that for some of these girls their chance to make money is to play overseas. Uh, how much does everyone have to give up to, to make this happen and give Australia a shot at a, at a gold? It takes a lot, Steph, and I think, um, and listening to the girls, and I'm nodding because my role at the moment, I retired seven years ago. I played... Um, close to 400 games in the Women's National Basketball League and um, retired seven years ago and I'm now the sponsorship manager for Basketball ACT. But I think certainly for Carrie, insofar as um, achieving the best preparation for the team in the Olympic year and asking them, I, I understand, to sacrifice some of their earning capacity um, you know, by playing internationally, I think it's a big ask. But, you know, it's, uh, often you need to make a short-term sacrifice, sacrifice for a long-term uh, gain, you know, if they're prepared to do that and sacrifice some short-term uh, earning capacity for perhaps a longer-term gain, certainly a gain in so far as what they may achieve on court with the Opals and possibly, <coughs> excuse me, as we know the spin-off could be, if the team has success on court, they may well become more appealing and more successful off court. Alice, you are an Olympic medalist. What sacrifices did you have to make and... Uh, what more do you think could have been done to help you? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the first time I suppose I was an Olympic medalist, I was 18, six months out of school. So the sacrifices then were a little different to when they were in 08 when I was 22 and had a life. Um, I think in 04 it was more like don't go to parties at school and don't do trips away with your, with your friends and no schoolies and, and things like that. But um, that was also at a time when there weren't as many successful female swimmers, so it was a lot easier to get sponsorship. In 08, the sacrifices that I had to make were, I had to move, I moved to Canberra, and I, so I had to leave my family, and I, you know, I had to sort of scrimp and save and study and work to be able to pay rent and, and things like that. So um, it's not as easy as it seems. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you're just an overnight success, but... There's a lot, a lot more behind it. I think women's sport has come to a point where we are so successful and we're still not getting the recognition that we deserve that just with these little pushes that we're talking about tonight and, and the whole incentive of, uh, of this whole new program that they've got going on, I think um, there's a lot of room for us to move forward in the next even five years. There might be a big jump. All right, Grace Gill, all the way over there. You are semi-pro. Uh, what does that mean? What else do you have to do to survive? Because I would guess that in, in a lot of women's athletes' eyes, playing in the W League is semi-pro, but you still have jobs and yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. things on your time. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, Today I got up at 6am and I went to gym. I went straight to work, worked 9 to 5, went straight to training, came straight here. So at a national level, it's pretty similar to an international level. So while we're semi-pro, we still work as hard as the pros do. And um, well, at least you got fed tonight. <laughs> I know, I was starving. <laughs>
We're doing what we can to look Thank after you. you. How difficult is it, even though you're getting paid? I guess there's a difficulty of finding an employer that will be flexible in your working hours. Uh, luckily enough, I am um, my supervisor's quite understanding about me taking time off the training or leaving early. But a lot of the girls, they'll need to find casual jobs where they can come and go as they please. Girls who are in the Matildas, they'll be away for a month at a time. And it's just difficult to try and find people who are understanding of that commitment to the sport. Um, well, you've done quite a bit to raise the profile of women's sport. You're the poster girl of the uh, first season of the W League, or rather last year. Uh, did it work? What was the reaction to it? Do you think it paid off? Uh, I think it did at a level in Canberra. I think it did because Canberra's a small enough place for that type of thing to be recognised. Uh, it was an interesting experience. There was uh, a few people who would recognise me and I'd have no idea who they were, but apparently they'd seen me hanging in the Belcon and Mall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, <laughs> you do what you can. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picturing you hanging yeah, in no, the Belcon Mall. Literally. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, ladies, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you about uh, Andy's idea that he proposed before about a, a dedicated channel. It would be 50% lifestyle, 50% women's sport. And uh, maybe I'll give you guys down that end a rest and start up here with Alison. Do you think it would work? Oh, look, I, I actually do think it's a fantastic idea. And, and my colleagues and I at the table were just discussing this. And, and it, I don't think we should be competing with the men um, for, for coverage. We should have our own section. Um, and, and I think it's uh, I think it would be good to aim for that and there are just so many wonderful stories of women achieving great things in our country and, and now with the internet I know you can search bits and pieces but there's just not enough out there uh, for for people to see and, and I think it will help give us a platform as well to at least say to the sponsors look this is our section in the paper this is our section on the news um, we can get in there. The more we expose people to our sport and our stories well the better it is and and generally in our experience certainly locally that um, you know when people do experience the Transact Capitals or they experience a women's national basketball league match or the personalities or they have Carrie Graff visit their school or Jessica Bibby who's delivering a new initiative called the Healthy Hoops for Active Kids program. When they get to touch and see and smell and engage with our, our people, our ambassadors, they love them. There's generally, you know, it's a positive move when we do have the opportunity to engage with people and to expose ourselves. Uh, not like many male sports people expose themselves, but rather as we expose <laughs> our stories as, as female sports people and as females, that, um, that absolutely resonates with people. Alice, I, I want to come on to you. 50% uh, lifestyle, 50% women's sport. Is that something you'd watch? Even just hearing things about how mothers, you know, train and work and still have time for their kids, things like that, that you know, especially other women would really take hold of. And, you know, even if it was hosted by a, a former Australian sporting great woman, I mean, can't really go wrong. A lot of women in, in the public, um, you know, don't get to see women's sport on TV, and, and I think it's a great idea. And do you think it's more important that uh, women would want to watch it? or that men would want to watch it, or that uh, uh, perhaps the population in general? Because I, I think it's sometimes difficult to tell who the, uh, who the networks are trying to pull in, because there are a lot of women who view sport in general, and I think that perhaps gets forgotten. But th this would really, and Andy's probably going to jump up and correct me here, be targeted at women. Um, well, I know men that watch Lifestyle, but... Yeah, well, I know... Um, my partner loves to watch any sport, so, you know, um, men love sport as well, and I'm sure a lot of men would enjoy it if there's a bit of beach volleyball on there or something. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they would. <laughs> something I find really refreshing is that I think a lot of people who come along to our games or sort of come along with a sort of... I don't know, predisposition in mind of how women's football is going to be and they'll see us play and they'll sort of go, wow, like, they're actually pretty good. And I think if we can continue to push for that and push for that type of channel, they'll see that and that will just build it more and more. I think it's really important for women 
in sport to continue to get along to grassroots level sport because I find that when we do that as athletes going along to schools and community based areas they really get such a buzz out of us being there and they can aspire to something. It's up to I guess the individuals as well as the organisation to do as much as you can to get people involved and get their information out there. Certainly swimming does its part in getting everyone not just the big stars out but, but all of you all of your whole team there. Which yeah, is, swimming which has is already great. always been very good nurturing the grassroots and I think that's why we've been successful for so long. Who would you be targeting to uh, lift the profile? Definitely parents. <clears throat> as we know, or as many of us as parents, you know, mum and dad's taxi service is often the, you know, the way that kids get to sport in the early days. <clears throat> I think, or I, I'm waiting for that day when I lose control, my daughter's only two, but you know, it's a few years away when I start to lose control over you know, what she does and boys come on the scene and what have you. But absolutely we need to talk to parents, uh, to be talking to parents to communicate to them about the virtues of our sports and you know, sport helped, I, I mean I wasn't a rotten kid, but basketball helped keep me off the streets and that's got to be you know, enticing for parents to you know, to to help your child along the way to, um, you know, to put them in a great learning environment. So absolutely need to keep talking to, uh, to parents. Um, jumping to answer your question, I, I would love to see, and we're working locally, I want to see diversified media coverage. I want, I think, each of us and, and all of our sporting, female sporting colleagues represent real women. I, you know, I'd love to see these girls on the front of Vogue and on New Idea and Women's Weekly because I think for most of us, you know, I th I'm pretty happy that we represent very special women. You know, I don't think a size 8 or size 10 female that <clears throat> eats lettuce leaves and doesn't have a proper diet, um, you know, really represents the bulk of us. So I'd like to see diversified media coverage of, of women's sport and that we you know, are ambassadors for regular women because I think we, we are more than a lot of other females that we see uh, represented in the media. Look, I, I think that we are stuck in a bit of a vicious circle. Uh, lack of media coverage, lack of this, lack of that. And I think what, what Andy's doing with Sports Hydrant is fantastic. This Sport for Women Day is a great chance for everyday Australians to participate in a, in a national event where we can raise the awareness of women's sport and, and women's health and, and, and active lifestyles. And, um, and what we're going to do as well with this, uh, with, with the media coverage and the partnership with that, we're going to help raise the profile um, to everyday Australians for women's sport. And we're hoping as well that, that the website, sportshydro.com, will sort of act as a bit of a hub for um, athletes, sorry, athletes and, um, and the media to come together and tell their stories and, and raise the, the women's issues and, and that kind of stuff. So if we can have a place where any athlete can post up their news and that kind of stuff, at least then there's somewhere for people to go to, to see the news now and, and hopefully start requesting it of the media because it's the, it, really it's the media. I mean, I didn't really know of, of Alicia until she just won five medals and it was because of the media. So I think to raise our profile to get in the media is, is a big way to do it. And I think what, what Andy's doing is fantastic and we should all support it. Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to please put your hands together for these six wonderful women. Steph, thank you. Um, ladies, gentlemen, but particularly the ladies, the athletes, uh, and Mark and uh, Lee, thank you. Fantastic information. Really, really interesting evening. So thank you very much indeed. However, it would not be possible without our uh, supporters. And I'd really like to thank ANSTO, which is the Australian Nuclear Scientific and Technical Organisation, AMP, Barbica States, Dimensional, who returned to uh, supporters this year, uh, Bruce Mansfield at FPOSC returning, uh, Macquarie Telecom, Microsoft, and uh, uh, new supporters, Virgin Blue. Thank you to all of you, because it wouldn't happen without you.